Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Henning Lincoln Semester, um, and assignments are due. Uh, but this is interesting. We, 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 we get to hear what buzzwords mean. Um, Paul is here. You may know Paul. Paul tutors an obscene amount of things. I've tutored about half of you. Yeah. Um, I saw his schedule once, and uh, I didn't want to see him again. <laughs> Uh, he's also starting soon, uh, potentially, as a PhD candidate uh, in blockchain and sidechains. Yes. yes. I'll, I'll let him introduce himself. You're welcome. Okay, so um, as um, the main introduce, yes, I'm Paul. Uh, if you want to contact me after the presentation, I can be reached on UQC Slack um, at PAH. Um, I'm also on GitHub. Various pieces of code that, oh, uh, that maybe of interest there. So today we're going to go over Bitcoin and Ethereum primarily, the fundamentals of blockchain and what's the future. So, uh, okay, I have that slide. So yeah, what what is blockchain? Why current applications, future applications, and future developments? So some of these images should be familiar to you, um, especially if you weren't living under a rock in late 2017. Um, so, <clears throat> this curve here is the price of Bitcoin over time. Um, I would also say it's proportional to the hype that Bitcoin and blockchain has had um, over time. So you might notice that it's been on a downwards trend for a while, it's gone a long way from the moon. Um, there's been various forks of Bitcoin, so that's um, derivatives of Bitcoin. Uh, some of you may have heard of Dogecoin. Unfortunately, we don't discuss Dogecoin much today, but it is extremely similar to Bitcoin. In fact, it's more primitive now. Um, there's a lot of misapplications of blockchain. We have um, Porsche reckons you can't need to blockchain in it. I have yet to see how that's a good idea. Uh, not pictured here, um, has anyone heard of Long Island Ice Tea? Yeah, um, well, they renamed themselves at some stage to um, Long Chain Ice Tea or something like that. 300% increase in share price or something like that. Anyway. Uh, finally, I like this um, description of what is blockchain. Uh, if I had to explain it to grandparents. Uh, if you can't read it, imagine if keeping your car idle for 24-7 uh, produced solve to do food puzzles that you can sell pair of. That's not too far away from what most people think blockchain is. Uh, I'm trying to prove that it's not too dissimilar from that minus the last part about buying care of uh, and that's what everyone thinks blockchain looks like. Okay, so what is actually blockchain? Uh, first of all, I will need to introduce some primitives. Uh, blockchain pretty much relies on hashing. Like, pretty much everything blockchain has a lot of hashing in it. So, simply put, hashing is the ability to take some inputs, so bytes, bits, strings, any data, and convert it to a fixed size output. So the examples we have here, we have this SHA-256, for example. The 256 stands for 256 bits in the other. Um, so the, the useful property of these hashes is um, they're one way. So calculating a hash is easy, and that's computation, uh, computationally rather fast. Um, but it's very hard to go backwards. So having a hash, it's infeasible to find the original input. No, the fastest way to find that input is to brute force random inputs, so try random inputs to see if you can produce the same hash. Um, as you can imagine, that's extremely inefficient. Um, another nice property, not as, not as essential in the understanding of a hash, is um, collision resistance. Effectively, it's impossible to find the x1 and the x2, um, so two different inputs that produce the exact same hash. Collisions do exist, um, but ideally they are extremely rare. So with that property, it's generally assumed if you hash two files and you get the same hash, those files should be identical. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is blockchain. So blockchain is a compound word. It consists of the word block and chain. So these blue squares and then rectangles are blocks, and you can think of these arrows as chains. So um, hashing. Actually, oh, sorry. So um, I start saying here it's a glorious linked list. Um, for those of you who don't know what a linked list is, um, imagine you have a data structure, 
um, I'll show you another data structure at this stage. And it keeps a reference to another version of itself, but it can also store data. Um, and if you keep chaining that, you have a linked list. Okay, so a blockchain has that um, in that, so this ampersand means address, so like the memory address of that item. But then we also have these hashes. In this case, the hash to the previous, uh, the hash of the previous block. So by having that hash, um, we can tell if any of the data in a previous block has changed. Um, so these hashes are generated by inputting all the data from a block. So in this case, um, block zero, hash it, store that hash here, and any change we can detect that. Similarly, if any change is made to data two, having just this hash and this block, I can detect that change has been made because I'll get a different hash when I try hashing that block. So, your yeah, blocks have headers and data. Uh, we'll get some data part shortly. But the main thing to remember is there's hashes um, connecting these together, and we can tell when a change has occurred. Uh, yeah, we get integrity. Integrity can be detected. Okay. So, how is data stored? Uh, so, not all blockchains do this, uh, but Bitcoin does this. So, um, we saw transactions in what's called a local tree, another data structure. Um, the nice thing about a Merkle tree is if any of these pieces of data here change, so let's say L1 was Alice pays Bob five Bitcoin, for example. If that was changed to um, Alice pays Bob 100 Bitcoin because Bob's been malicious, um, that can be detected because I'll produce a different hash here, upsetting that hash, upsetting that hash. Uh, and so we can efficiently tell if anything's changed. Uh, similarly, uh, we can also detect um, if a piece of data is part of the tree without having all the uh, without checking all the data in the tree. So let's say I want to check that L1 is actually a transaction that is a part of this uh, local tree and inside this block. I need that. I need that um, transaction. I need the hash of transaction L2 here, and then I need the hash of um, this subtree over here. And with only these three pieces of data, I can find a path from L1 up to the top hash. Uh, and so we can efficiently um, log, uh, a big old log, and if you know what that means, at a time, find if we've got membership. Yeah. Okay. Right. So yeah. finding the membership is just to recreate the hash at the top, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you can recreate the hash at the top, it's assumed that that is part of the um, transaction. Yes. Okay. So that's blockchain in a nutshell. So if you walk out of here, that's actually how blockchain works. Um, not necessarily with medical trees, but the hash at least. Um, so now we'll look at Bitcoin. So from here on out, if I say blockchain, I really mean blockchain platform. So in this case, Bitcoin is a blockchain platform. You've got a Bitcoin blockchain. And then you've got all the functionality built on top of that. Um, yeah. And so the basics of cryptocurrencies. So a lot of cryptocurrencies, there's thousands of them. Uh, most of them started off as derivatives of Bitcoin and developed from there. But some of them are also original ideas. So the reason I choose Bitcoin, um, obviously it's the oldest. Um, but it's also relatively simple. And it's a good vehicle for um, teaching what, what's required in a blockchain platform. Uh, most of what you see here when I describe Bitcoin is also relevant uh, when we look at a figure later in this presentation. Okay, so primary components. So Bitcoin's got a distributed ledger. In this, in this case, it's a blockchain. Um, it's distributed in that multiple nodes, computers, have a copy of this blockchain. Uh, I'll get to the unspent transaction outputs later. Uh, so then we've got networking, um, how do you make transactions, and then consensus, that is, agreeing on what is the state of the blockchain, what transactions have actually occurred, like what is the state of the world. Uh, so I'll go over networking here, because this could probably do with its own presentation, not just about blockchain, but in general, for peer-to-peer -peer communication. So, uh, as you know, Bitcoin is a public blockchain. Anyone can access it. Anyone can make a transaction, assuming you throw enough money at it. 
um, and it's decentralized. As I said, anyone can run a node if you have sufficient storage, or you can run a light node and just verify blocks that are coming into the network, for example. Um, so why would you want to run a light node? Um, current blockchain is 215 gigabytes as of um, end of last month. I'm not sure about you, but my laptop does not have that much spare space. So all transactions and new blocks, um, we'll, start, we'll talk about new blocks later. Um, these are shared by peer-to-peer -peer communication. Um, so for those of you who don't know, peer-to-peer, -peer, so when you try connecting to, let's say, facebook.com or google.com, you're connecting to their servers. They do actually have servers across the world, but you're connecting effectively to a server. They know everything that's going on, and then they send that answer back to you. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, you send data to all your peers, a bunch of individual nodes or machines, and they'll keep sharing that data throughout the network. Eventually, everyone gets the data, in this case, a transaction or a new block. Um, there's not, so there's not necessarily guarantees on performance here, and there's not necessarily um, guarantees that your transaction data um, will reach everyone, but it should reach the majority of nodes. Uh, the way you join the network is um, by what's called a bootstrapping process. Um, so if you have wallet software, the software you use to manage, let's say, Bitcoin uh, wallet address, there's a bunch of nodes um, pre-stored in that wallet code, and it'll connect to those to find other nodes in the network, and it can build from there. Okay, so making a transaction. Uh, this will go for a little while. So um, in Bitcoin, you don't actually have a balance um, stored with your wallet address, you actually have a bunch of unspent transactions, or um, oh, it's not listed here now, um, but uh, UTXO, so unspent transaction outputs. So these are outputs from previous transactions. So any given transaction in Bitcoin, effectively you need to refer to a previous transaction, so transaction ID, and what are the outputs from that transaction? And you'll always have one too many uh, transaction inputs to a transaction. Um, I put an asterisk there because there is one exception in Bitcoin and a lot of other blockchains. Um, and then you've got your output. So output is effectively paying people. Uh, so you say what value you want to send to someone, what is their public key, we'll get to that soon, um, and their public key hash. Uh, so public key can be sort of seen as maybe a username or some way of identifying someone. Uh, there is always one to end um, outputs to a transaction. Uh, okay, so what is uh, public key encryption? So just a bit of a side. Um, so you have your public key and you have your private key. So your public key, uh, as I said, sort of your user or ID. Um, you've got private keys. Uh, this is something, as the name suggests, you should keep private. It's your secret. Don't share this. Uh, and so, sort of your password. So, the idea of public key encryption is that neither key um, yields useful information about the other. Technically, they do yield a bit of information, but it's still computationally hard to derive the other key because uh, you're trying to perform some very um, difficult mathematics. Okay. Uh, so why is this of interest at all? Um, so when you browse the internet, this is how your encryption works between you and a server typically. Um, but we can use the keys in a different way to make what's called signatures um, and verify ownership of a public key, or really ownership of the private key, but without sharing that private key. So when, when you go to make a transaction, um, what you'll do is, once you've um, written up what your transaction looks like and you've converted that, uh, to the JSON you're going to send uh, to the network, you'll produce a hash of it and then you'll um, sign out the hash. So the way you sign it, um, it is by encrypting it with your private key, so the key that only you have. Then other nodes on the network can verify that that transaction has come to you by decrypting it with your public key, which is assumed public, like you can freely give it to someone. And so if the encryption of an object with a private key and then encrypted again with a public key yields um, the original transaction, then you've effectively proven that you own the private key for that public key. Okay. So an example transaction 
Uh, so Alice wants to send Bob by Bitcoin. Uh, so that's the official symbol for Bitcoin. Uh, BTC is the far more common devil on the internet. Um, so Alice has previously uh, been given 10 Bitcoin from a transaction outputs, uh, from this transaction output number zero. Uh, so she only wants to pay Bob five Bitcoin, so obviously she doesn't want to send that all through the end. So initially she says, okay, five Bitcoin goes to Bob and hashes Bob's key. That's one of the outputs. <coughs> We then have, uh, so she wants her money back uh, that she's not spending. So it should dedicate 4.9 Bitcoin uh, back to herself. Now, normally you don't send Bitcoin back to your own address. You actually create a new address and send it there. So for security reasons, you don't want to reuse your Bitcoin address. If you're using wallet software that handles these keys, you generally don't need to worry about this. It. It'll take care of it. Uh, so you might notice that's only 4.9. Uh, so nothing's free in life, uh, there's no free lunch. So miners, we'll get to them soon, or people who verify transactions and put them onto the actual blockchain. Uh, they want to earn some money out of this, uh, and generally the more you pay, the faster your transaction will be processed. Um, so high transaction fees are more attractive to miners. Now, note here though that the, uh, the public key here is not actually set to anything, it's blank. So the miner who will generate a lock later will fill that in with their address and claim ownership of those coins. Okay, um, so some final remarks on Bitcoin transactions um, and really the programmability of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, so Bitcoin actually has a programming language called Scripts. It's uh, a derivative of another very primitive programming language. Uh, and effectively, transa transactions are encoded in that programming language. Uh, so script instructions are put into a stack um, and executed. Um, so the great thing about a stack, uh, it, you can only have a finite number of instructions, and the language prevents looping. Um, so you are guaranteed termination of any Bitcoin script. Uh, that's rather useful. Uh, yeah, but more instructions will also cost you more. So we're talking about the transaction fee here. If, um, let's say, you require multiple signatures to release uh, the coins we paid for, that takes more instructions. That will cost more in this transaction as well. Uh, yeah. So if, for example, you are requiring multiple signatures, that's considered a smart contract. Um, and that's about as sophisticated as you can get with more than Bitcoin. So the reason why Ethereum is very popular is because these smart contracts can actually be smart. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is what a stack looks like. So uh, effectively, when you write the script and then publish your transaction, all the instructions are pushed onto the stack of um, one node to verify your block or a miner. It processes that transaction, and if it's valid and it proves that you own those coins that you're trying to spend um, and successfully executes everything, then that transaction will likely become part of the blockchain. Um, so mining, uh, consensus, and proof of work. Um, so these all go hand in hand. So in Bitcoin, at least, the new blocks generate approximately every 10 minutes. So that's not fixed. Um, I was looking at the history just for this presentation. Um, they had a block come out in less than two minutes, for example. Um, but the overall goal, like the average you're trying to achieve, is 10 minutes. Uh, so the difficulty, the so. The difficulty is controlled by the number of zeros we want at the start of a hash um, when we hash a block. So if we recall when that early slide when I was showing blockchain, we had hashes the previous block. We want it when we produce the hash of this current block that it has so many zeros at the start. Now for a given input, you only have exactly one hash. So we change the input by having what's called a nonce in the arm block. Um, so a nonce can be seen as just an integer, a number that you keep increasing until you find a number such that um, that number inside a block produces a hash with so many zeros at the front. Um, so for each zero we add to the front of the hash, as in bit zero we want to add to the front of that hash, it doubles the difficulty and doubles the amount of time on average it takes to produce a block. Uh, yeah, so blocks that meet the requirements of the hash um, have valid transactions in it um, and otherwise a valid timestamp. 
uh, those blocks will be broadcast across the network, so the computer that finds it will broadcast it. Uh, that computer will also um, have put its um, Bitcoin address into all the transactions to receive the um, transaction fees. Uh, so one thing about blocks, even if you make it onto the blockchain, it's not actually final yet, or not necessarily final. Um, so you can have um, what's called forks in blockchains, um, where you effectively have multiple blocks building on separate chains, um, driving for a common, uh, deriving from a common block earlier. Um, eventually, one of those chains will become longer than the other and propagate around the network and become the de facto chain. So it's generally considered that if a chain is, like, if your transaction occurred six blocks ago, chances are this is the longest chain now. Not guaranteed, but it's probabilistically extremely likely. Uh, actually, another comment I'll make. Um, so a Bitcoin block is only about one megabyte. It sounds big, it's actually rather small. Uh, this can hold approximately 2,000 transactions in one of those Merkle trees we saw earlier. Uh, so let's do some quick maps. Okay, so if we do some quick maps, uh, if we uh, generate a new block every 10 minutes, and there's 2,000 transactions per block, that's uh, right. Okay, so that's 12,000 transactions per hour. So how many is that per second? or 3.33 transactions a second. That is, only three people on the planet can transfer Bitcoin per second on average. Um, in comparison, PayPal can easily do about, uh, I think, 5,000 or something like that, and Visa can easily do like 40,000 transactions a second under peak load. So um, Bitcoin's not scalable. Well, at least the current implementation is not scalable. Uh, so those transaction fees uh, were ridiculously high uh, around the end of 2017. So we saw the peak in the Bitcoin price at 20,000 USD. Uh, if you wanted to make a transaction around that time, it might cost you about 40 US dollars to get your um, like 40 US dollars worth of Bitcoin to get your transaction onto the blockchain. So if you put less than that, your transaction may never get processed or might take a long time. And yeah, they got very out of hand. So, oh, and the other thing is, that's a constant amount no matter how much Bitcoin you want to transfer. So if you're transferring like, a few cents worth of Bitcoin versus like a few thousand dollars of Bitcoin, same transaction cost. So that's part of the reason why Bitcoin's referred to as digital gold. It's hard to work with like gold. Okay. Um, so, as we said, mining is related back to hashing. So pretty much the faster you can hash, the higher your probability of producing the next block. Oh, did I talk about that? Uh, okay, I, I, I mention this. Uh, but if you are the one to find the correct hash, the first hash that satisfies the condition with all the zeros, you also get free Bitcoin. Uh, that's a decreasing amount over time. But if, like, if you were to successfully pull it off by yourself, that's um, a few thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, actually tens of thousands of dollars of Bitcoin um, becoming yours. So effectively 10,000, oh, actually not 10,000, about 40,000 dollars worth of Bitcoin is generated every 10 minutes. Okay, um, so this is the evolution of um, hash rates effectively. So once upon a time, you could actually use even a brick like that or a regular laptop um, and successfully be competitive in a Bitcoin network and add Bitcoins. That would have been about four or five years ago now if that made any sense, and really six or seven years ago. Um, for context, Bitcoin turned 10 this year. Uh, eventually, people started getting serious about Bitcoin and serious about trying to mine faster. So there were drivers that allowed video cards, so the same stuff that renders an image on your computer, um, to start doing these hashes. So you notice we get from about 5.5 mega hashes a second to 5.5 million hashes a second to 650. We've just jumped two orders of magnitude. Um, these are cost effective. They're about the same price as the CPU, although they do use more power. But if you optimize them, they're very efficient. So the great thing about these two technologies is most people have these in some way, shape, or form and could play with Bitcoin. They could try mining and have a fair chance. Um, and then as Bitcoin really took off and the economies of scale were appeared, um, it made sense to build these ASICs. So ASICs are fixed purpose hardware, so they can't do anything besides what they are built to do. 
So if think software is soft, you can change that code and your CPU can work with software. Imagine typing software and then turning it into hardware, that's effectively what ASIC is. So these things can do hashes really fast, they can't do anything else though. Uh, so people build warehouses out of these, uh, they build warehouses where energy is cheap or cooling is free. Uh, Iceland's a great example because it's cold outside. Uh, also some places in the US and China, Russia, um, have really cheap power and so these assets make sense. Uh, so in context, I think this warehouse here has one petahash a second worth of performance. And then to put that into context, um, in 29, sorry, as of today, roughly, there is 45 exahashes a second worth of performance in the Bitcoin network. Uh, yeah, so what does that cost? Everything. Uh, no, to be more precise, um, it's actually about 29 terawatt hours a year of energy. So uh, uh, for those of you who aren't electrical engineers, that's a lot of energy. Um, the average household uses about 20 kilowatt hours a day at most, depending on how many people, what you're doing if it's summer. Uh, so that's more energy usage than um, a lot of countries, including Ireland, uh, most of Africa. Like it's, it's a lot of energy. Uh, I can't remember the statistic, but a fair majority of Iceland's power usage is actually Bitcoin mining as well. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that energy effectively does nothing useful. So these hashes are worth nothing. All these hashes do is produce a block that everyone considers as valid and pays the network count. These, so these calculations, this 29 terawatt hours a year of energy, it's not scientific computing, it's not it's not doing anything useful, it's literally just hashing. Um, so obviously there is a need to improve this and move away from this proof of work. Uh, anyway, so why do people mine? I probably should have covered this one first. Um, so yeah, we've mentioned uh, transaction fees. You get a reward when you create a block. Um, so there's uh, producing a uh, hash with some zeros at the front. Um, so mathematically, if the reward um, you earn times the probability of a given time span is greater than the cost over the same time span, uh, that's profitable. And again, that only works when you've got econ economies of scale. Uh, yeah, the nice and interesting thing about Bitcoin, which um, still stumps um, some people today, um, is the economic incentive, uh, incentives to do the right thing. So. There's a lot of things you can do wrong in Bitcoin and potentially earn a lot more money than following the rules. Uh, but the way Bitcoin is developed, it's very expensive, generally computationally, hence financially, um, to try attacking the network and um, either blocking transactions or generating false transactions called double spend. Uh, okay, so that's Bitcoin in a nutshell. And uh, that forms the foundation for Ethereum. So, do we have any questions before I move on? Okay. So, we'll cover Ethereum uh, briefly. Uh, so, that's our logo, it's nice and pretty. Okay, so what is it? It's, fundament it's fundamentally Bitcoin, although it's not derived from Bitcoin, it's extremely different um, in some ways. Uh, so, unlike Bitcoin, it is incrementally improving. Bitcoin's been very, very much the same since it was incarnated. There was a few changes in the early days when people didn't care much about it. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to get any changes pushed. Uh, so another thing about Ethereum is it's trying to move, this, uh, move towards this thing called proof of stake. Uh, so unlike proof of work, the consensus where we're spending more and more effort finding each other to produce the right hash. Uh, proof of stake involves um, staking so many uh, so much money, in this case EVA, which is the currency of Ethereum. Um, so staking that this block that you've generated is valid, not thinking, like, not thinking about the hash, but just generating a valid block and saying the transactions within a valid. Staking coins on it, and then getting that block accepted and earning a small reward. So the current issues with that is how do you set up the economics for this, um, and how do you make it fair? Um, it's an ongoing issue, and again, that can be its own presentation. Uh, and that field is constantly changing. Like, if you look up um, proof of stake right now, the article's probably been changed within the past week. 
Okay, so Ethereum, like Bitcoin, is programmable. In this case, we have the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, so for those of you who have done Java, you might have come across the Java virtual machine. It's just a virtual machine you can program it towards. Uh, so not mentioned here is its programming language called Solidity. So again, it's only a unique language. It's influenced by JavaScript, uh, and like JavaScript, it's dodgy. Uh, so one great thing about Ethereum is it can't be efficiently mined on ASICs. Um, there are claims out there now that there are ASICs that can do it. The main thing that makes it difficult is you need several gigabytes of high performance memory um, when you're doing these hashes so that you can also process transactions um, and other computations done with the EVM. So right now the most efficient way to run Ethereum node is um, ports video cards. Uh, because they can do these transactions, uh, process these transactions, and have several gigs of memory. The problem is that the amount of memory we need is increasing faster than the rate of which video cards are getting memory attached. So, like in a couple of years' time, the amount of memory you need on your video card will be more than what's actually available on the market at a reasonable price. Okay, so the EVM. Uh, so, if you're trying to use the Ethereum blockchain, uh, and it's a uh, virtual machine. You've got the performance and storage capabilities of this phone, approximately. So even as you may have thousands of computers across the world processing your transaction in a distributed <coughs> manner, uh, they're actually doing it all in parallel, doing the exact same thing in parallel. Not doing different things um, in parallel, which is normally what you want. Uh, yeah, so as such, that's got its own limitations, and they're going to charge you a lot. Uh, for that very limited processing capability. So in Bitcoin, we said the cost is proportional to the number of instructions you want in your transaction, and transaction generally has a fixed number of operations. Um, so in Ethereum, you can't just transfer ether between um, other clients. I would suggest it's better blockchains if that's what you're doing, but Ethereum can do that. Uh, the real selling feature of Ethereum is that programmability, having a Turing complete language where you can do looping, um, and pretty much anything you can do in any other program. Uh, so the way you're charged is for gas. So you allocate gas in your transaction. Um, so gas is just how much time, effectively, you're going to allow it to run for. Each instruction has an amount of gas allocated to it. Uh, you then state what, uh, what uh, you're paying per unit of gas. So that's sort of the transaction fee here. Um, so you say what price you're offering per unit of gas that's used in this transaction. And miners will take transactions with the highest gas price. If your gas price is too low, your transaction will not be processed, or will not process be will not be processed in due manner. Uh, so I've actually played with Solidity quite a lot. Uh, the documentation is crap, so at least, but it's a hell of a lot better than most other blockchains. Uh, and there are some non-blockchain programming languages that are even worse documentation-wise. Uh, but it's popular enough that you've got Stack Overflow, something I'm sure you are all very familiar with. Uh, yeah, it's sufficient to get yourself in trouble, uh, not necessarily sufficient to get yourself out. It tells you what not to do, but yeah. Okay, so smart contracts, if I can program anything, that encourages me to build um, decentral, uh, decentralized applications. So recall the um, centralization we said with like Google, Facebook, um, or maybe a simple example of something like eBay or um, Airbnb. You're relying on a centralized server, a centralized source of truth, um, and you're trying to interact with that, normally via a web browser, or in this day and age, a uh, phone app. Um, so with these smart contracts on the blockchain, um, and all these computers running your code effectively, you can implement your app such that it's running on all these other computers, such that if one of those individual computers fails, um, you've had no loss. There's other nodes on the network that will still process these transactions. Uh, so this feature is called Web3. Um, so we're currently on Web2, whatever that is. Uh, web3 is a decentralized web, and that's where you're going to have these dApps, not necessarily Ethereum dApps, but decentralized apps running somewhere, not centralized. And you're accessing it via a web browser with like regular HTML, CSS interface potentially. Um, so this sort of exists right now. Uh, if you open up uh, any modern browser like Firefox or Chrome, and you install a plugin called MetaMask, Effectively, you can now access Ethereum, um, like Ethereum blockchain, uh, via your browser, and make payments to use decentralized apps. Uh, 
So there is a blockchain course effectively at uni called Comms 4507. Uh, so in that course, uh, my group, we decided to build a decentralized Airbnb. Uh, so no, this pricing is going to be relevant of September 1, 2018. Uh, it is a little expensive to do things on the Ethereum blockchain. So for example, making accounts in our system, I estimated that was going to cost anywhere between $5.50 and $28 roughly. Uh, similarly, if you want to uh, like put your house on there, it's going to go from $6 to $30. Making booking is a dollar to $6. And now you have to pay to leave ratings, a dollar fifty for like seven dollars seventy. So uh, obviously there's some issues there. Um, although one potential benefit is at least ratings are probably more meaningful if you had to throw a dollar fifty at it. <laughs> On top of transaction fees. Oh, sorry, that is a transaction fee. Yeah. Um, so uh, this eager way. Um, so way is a subunit of currency of Ether. I think it's a millionth. I can't remember. Oh, no, it's a trillion. Yeah. Uh, so, a summary. Uh, so, a summary of the what section. So, what was what was blockchain? What was Bitcoin? What was Ethereum? Uh, yep. So, we covered the basics of Bitcoin and similar. Uh, if you want to see more, there's a white paper. So, the white paper gives technical concepts, uh, but generally they're meant to be rather easy to read. So for example, the Bitcoin white paper is only 20 pages. It's got plenty of pictures in it. And if you know what hashing is, you can actually get through it pretty easily. Um, I would highly recommend you read it. It's not a bad white paper if you want to get yourself into reading academic papers as well. OK, so we've looked at Ethereum and Solidity uh, briefly. Uh, again, they're going to have its own dedicated presentation for either of those topics. Um, and there's many subtopics of Ethereum that you can look at as well. Ethereum is rapidly evolving. Uh, this company is for a lot of money at it, um, and even pay their employees with it. Uh, it's potentially the future, but it's probably going to be superseded at some stage. But right now, it's big. It's the second largest cryptocurrency by market value, and it's the largest development platform for decentralized apps. Uh, so again, it has a white paper. Um, it also has a yellow paper. So a yellow paper is more a technical guideline of um, how it works. Um, so that is rather maths heavy, programming heavy. Um, but if you would ever develop very seriously, you would need to read that paper. So I have read sections of it. Um, but the documentation is generally rather sufficient. Um, yeah, so I haven't really discussed the software that you would use to typically interact with blockchain, be it Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, so wallet software is the main one, so that's where you um, keep track of your addresses. Um, but there's also many other clients available, um, you know, command line clients. Um, a point of difference I want to make though is um, wallet software that you manage your keys yourself and websites such as Coinbase. So if you go to a website like Coinbase and say, I want five Bitcoin, um, they'll say, you have five Bitcoin. Um, but that Bitcoin doesn't really exist. Like, it's not like they've generated a wallet uh, for you and stored that five Bitcoin. It's just stored in the database, for example, saying you have five Bitcoin. So if you have what's called a hard fork for blockchain, so for example, Bitcoin's had many forks, one of which was Bitcoin Cash, aiming to make it scale better. Uh, when a fork occurs, all previous history is copied into that fork. In that case, your money is doubled if you're managing your addresses yourself. So for example, um, when Bitcoin Cash split, I can't remember, but I think Bitcoin was about 12,000 USD. Bitcoin Cash went from effectively zero dollars up to about five hundred dollars um, per bitcoin um, immediately so you got five hundred dollars per bitcoin you had pretty much within about one day if you had your coins on coinbase you didn't benefit from that uh, that's pretty much as much investing advice as i give <laughs> um, i have not discussed uh, various vulnerabilities and limitations um, so uh, blockchain is not without fault but there's never been a direct attack on Bitcoin or Ethereum. There's never been a compromise to any of the security relating to how they work, like hashing or encryption. Um, so in the case of Ethereum, uh, there's this thing called the DAO. Um, I can't remember what uh, I think it stands for Decentralized Organization or something like that. It was effectively a smart contract. You throw money at it, you'll earn money over time, and you can pull money from it. Uh, you can see this sort of as an investment vehicle. Uh, there was a bug in it, uh, two lines of code that you could conceivably think the order does not matter, 
does match that in solidity. So effectively, instead of um, debiting your, um, uh, so in Ethereum you have a balance attached to your ID as opposed to unspent transactions. Instead of debiting your balance before um, giving you money, so the, the balance in the, the auto contract, it would pay you the money first and then debit you. If you control the amount of gas that your contract had correctly, such that it ran out of gas between those two lines, you could take all the money out of the contract. Uh, in this case, they took 50 million USD out of it. Uh, and I haven't talked about the technical difficulties of using Ethereum smart contracts. It's very hard to interact with external data sources. So for example, if I want to access the current weather, I need to trust a node that is publishing the weather on the blockchain. I can't do anything else really. So there's a trust issue with trying to get external data. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so why use blockchain? And why not? Okay, uh, so this is the Garza Hype Cycle 2018. Uh, if you haven't seen one of these, these are pretty cool to look at once a year. Uh, so the most recent one is um, August 2018. So blockchain in 2017 was over here-ish. Uh, so we're approaching peak in place of expectation. Uh, remember that 2017 was the year of the Bitcoin, um, you can record a price, um, and unfortunately inflate, um, the expectations is proportional to the price of Bitcoin. Uh, so we see here that we're finally on the downwards part, so why am I doing a Bitcoin presentation this late in the history of blockchain? Because it's still relevant and there's some potential in blockchain. So in their case, they reckon the real potential will be achieved within five to ten years. Again, I, I don't know how to calculate this, but it's a rather respectable way, I suppose. Um, and you can see it amongst a bunch of other technologies you've probably heard of. Um, so for example, 5G is here, quantum computing, um, and various other interesting toys. Okay, so now getting back to why you use blockchain, so the real benefits. Uh, so immutability, once something's on the blockchain, and you've got about six blocks in front of it, in, the, in a public example, that data is considered immutable, it can't be changed. Like, every single node has to lose that blockchain effectively um, for that data to disappear. Uh, so that brings me on to we have redundancy, so you've got multiple nodes with all the same data on them. Um, you've got an audit trail, so you've got a, especially in the case of Ethereum, you can see each transaction and each function that's been called in these smart contracts what data was given to them and what changes occurred by replaying um, all the transactions that have occurred. It is computationally a little hard, but it's very, it's still doable. Like, it's something you can do on your laptop in a couple of minutes. Um, so security is a big one. Uh, you probably hear blockchain security a lot. Uh, so you can have confidentiality. We haven't seen that um, with either Bitcoin and Ethereum because they're public blockchains. You can see all data. Um, actually, going back to a point, um, so you're not actually anonymous when you use Bitcoin. Um, you've only got pseudo anonymity. That is, um, your Bitcoin address is not really bound to your name or bound to you. But for example, if you buy coins off Coinbase um, and then you ask Coinbase to transfer it to an actual wallet ID, Coinbase, for example, now knows that wallet ID um, is attached to your name or can assume it's attached to your name unless you're paying someone. And even if you send the coins to someone else, you've still got that trail per transaction of where those coins are gone. So there's always a, there's always a way to figure out where the coins have come from, since they were generated. Um, so we set the integrity, um, I can detect if any uh, blocks change that transactions are being tampered with. Um, availability, again, it's decentralized, you can always access it. Um, so authenticity, because you sign your transactions, um, Effectively, you're proving that I own these coins and I did create this transaction, which then also gives you non imputability So you can't take back saying, I didn't do that transaction, because you've signed that you have proved that you've done that transaction in a digital way. <coughs> um, so, this is a rather famous paper, or at least well known paper, called Do You Need a Blockchain? Uh, again, I highly recommend you read this one, it's only about eight pages. Uh, but this flowchart um, and the website that also emulates this flowchart is rather interesting. Uh, so most companies, if they were to apply this, they would very quickly end up here, don't use blockchain, use database or similar. 
Um, so, yeah. We've discussed permissionless blockchains, um, so Bitcoin and Ethereum, so that is anyone can do anything on this blockchain. So alternative ones, if our order writers are known, um, and they're not necessarily all trusted, is our public permission blockchains or private permission blockchains. So you can now have encrypted data on these, or you can have state that is hidden from other parties. Um, so notable implementations are uh, JP Morgan's Quorum, uh, Pipelet Jeff Fabric, which is by um, the Linux Foundation, and uh, Corda, which is not actually blockchain, but um, gives all those guarantees. Uh, again, each of those can have their own presentation. I do actually have a presentation about Quorum. Um, I might release that later. Uh, so this is a table from that paper, uh, the uh, Genie blockchain paper, comparing our uh, permissionless blockchain, so remember Bitcoin Ethereum, permissioned and a regular database. Uh, and this is a notable reason why you don't want to use a blockchain. It's slow. You've got very little throughput, as you saw with Bitcoin, but even if you have proof of stake, it's still limited because you have all that overhead sending transactions through a P2P network. So you've got that bad latency, uh, all of them can support a lot of readers and writers uh, to some extent. Uh, but yeah, it's trade-offs. But in general, that performance uh, disadvantage, that's the one that costs you. That's the one that you really want to avoid. So you really shouldn't use blockchain unless you really need it. Uh, so that brings me to use cases. Um, this is a pretty well-known XCKD. Um, I'll leave you to read it, but the two one don't read is um, software engineers do not like the idea of digital voting systems, uh, one of the proposed uses for blockchain. Uh, if you want to look this one up, it's uh, code 2030. Okay, so use cases. Uh, obviously cryptocurrencies, I think you're well and truly aware of it by now. Uh, financial services absolutely love on blockchain. Uh, so for example, common banks doing stuff with it. Uh, I'm sure all the banks really are doing something with it. Uh, oh, that JP Morgan I talked about, if you don't know who they are, they're a big American um, investment bank. Okay, uh, yeah, so the main things they like, uh, regulation and auditing. So we've just come out to the Financial uh, Royal Commission, uh, Financial Services Royal Commission. Um, and the main problem was that regulation was not being applied um, and auditability, a lot, of, a lot of things just weren't auditable feasibly audible. With blockchain, you have smart contracts that literally are like that regulation turned into code. And you can then have an order trail whenever that regulation has been applied. That's very easy to do with Ethereum and similar blockchains. Um, another thing that um, banks need to do, so whenever you send money to someone else via a traditional bank, so let's say someone's with Westpac, someone else is with ANZ, although you pay someone immediately, and a transaction, uh, sorry, and their balance updates. The money is not actually transferred between banks until about the close of business or some predetermined date. Um, and generally, that needs to go via a central bank or some other banks. The use of blockchain might allow you to avoid having all these uh, middle parties and allow you to directly transfer tokens or value or assets to other banks without an intermediary. Um, yeah, so that's about digital voting. Um, the problem with digital voting is um, trying to bind someone's ID to their vote while also trying to remain anonymous. Um, so with the digital identity, we were talking about public and private keys earlier. If you were to lose your private key, uh, even if you still have your public key, you're not getting that private key back without like, a lot of computation, like enough that it's, like, it's infeasible with current technology. Um, so there needs to be like, some way of handling how do we, like, how do we recover if people lose their private keys? Because everyone will lose their private key. Someone will lose their private key eventually, and someone might be able to vote as a result. Once you solve that kind of problem, you can start binding a lot of things to that digital identity. Uh, one other use, this one's not mentioned as much now, but it's still got some value is, um, in supply chains. So for example, you might have come across um, like this meat is organic or this fish has been fished in a sustainable way. Um, you can have um, each point in the supply chain have some sort of formal verification process, have that logged on the blockchain, and then you've got an order trail yet again of how that item has gone from its source, which has been proven to be its actual source, to the shops. Uh, 
That may not feel valuable to you, but um, in other contexts of this application, it's really valuable. Uh, this is also where we're dealing with counterfeits and fakes in other industries, like diamonds, for example. Okay, so what's next in blockchain? I realize we're almost out of time. Um, so efficiency, remember the 29 terawatt hours a year figure? That's just Bitcoin. There's a lot of other blockchains. Um, so not just efficiency in the safety environment, but also efficiency in scalability. So uh, Bitcoin does about four transactions a second. I think Ethereum's about eight, not much better. Um, and they will get to 16 pretty soon. Uh, so the simple solution is bigger blocks. That's what Bitcoin Cash did. Um, so they call themselves Cash because it should be easier to spend on cash as opposed to Bitcoin, which is like gold. They made their blocks bigger. I think it's initially four megabytes, or maybe 16 megabytes. So 16 times larger, 16 times as many transactions per unit of time. Uh, but the problem with that is we already saw Bitcoin's 215 gigabytes. If I have a block that's 16 times larger and I'm still producing them at the same rate, that's very quickly going to overtake Bitcoin because that, that grows linearly with time. We have multiple different blockchains. That's currently the status quo. So uh, yeah, we've got Bitcoin, we've got Ethereum, we've got Quorum, we've got um, Zero Cash. Uh, there's plenty of uh, IOS is another good one. Uh, so that's great, but how do you transfer value between those blockchains? At this stage, you can't. So again, you have to use a service like Coinbase or know someone who has coins and you trust uh, to try transferring currency between blockchains. <laughs> uh, and then there's um, sidechain, so my proposed uh, PhD topic. So this is ability within at least one blockchain type, so let's say um, Bitcoin. You have multiple Bitcoin blockchains and you can now um, spend transaction outputs on other Bitcoin blockchains and have them recognized. But there's many challenges in that. Um, so you need to make sure that like, you can't double spend coins across multiple blockchains. Um, you need to make sure that blockchains are actually recognized on other blockchains. Uh, and you need to make sure a lot of steps occur at the same time, or at least are guaranteed to occur or none occur. Um, if you've done any database course, you might come across the asset pr principle. Uh, so in terms of scalability um, and future blockchain, we want to avoid People needing special hardware. So again, Bitcoin's a lost game. It's going to be ASICs for the rest of its life. That's not going to change. Um, but any future blockchains really want to stay, like, like stay, like, be processable or consumer grade hardware. Ideally, your phone, but a laptop, I guess, is sufficient. But the internet of things is also getting on the blockchain. So again, if you have spare time, look up IoT. It's rather interesting. Um, I'm not going to cover this in full. Uh, but these are some alternatives to proof of work in terms of uh, consensus algorithms. So proof of work falls up here, you see a little miner. Uh, so we've got proof of stake, yeah, we've got proof of stake over here. So Ethereum and a lot of other blockchains are looking there because it should be efficient and if you can pull it off, then that's great. Um, but there's a few other um, interesting ones. I haven't heard that much. Um, so we've got proof of capacity or space. So proving that you have a lot of storage, be it memory or like disk space. Proving that you have time, or proving that you've waited amount of time, uh, is another way of doing consensus. Um, I won't bother covering the trial limit or the cat frame. That's a bit too technical, and if you want that, comes with five or seven different, um, or even a decentralized course like CSC four thousand and four. Okay, um, so legislation. Um, so we all heard of uh, GDPR, I'm sure we got a few hundred emails last year with the European flag in it, um, telling you that um, we've changed our terms and services, coincidentally. Um, it's 100.9, but it's very incompatible with blockchain. Uh, specifically, um, stuff that goes on blockchain pretty much can't be removed. Uh, you have the right to erase it um, within 30 days of request. So that doesn't work. Uh, you're not really that anon uh, anonymous on our blockchain um, and in most blockchain platforms. So your public key can still be traced back to a regular person at the end of the day, um, depending on what transactions you're doing. Um, similarly, a hash of your public key is still considered to be identifiable because you can reverse that hash eventually, um, which I would argue is a bit silly, but under the current legislation, hashes are reversible now. Uh, transparency, so every transaction or um, piece of data you have, whenever it's like processed in any way, that's publicly visible in most blockchains. 
Uh, that's meant to be hidden under um, GDPR. So if you're in Europe, you shouldn't be using blockchain or really the other way around. Blockchain should not be available in Europe. Uh, so alternatives to blockchain. Uh, so we saw earlier that databases are fast and relatively simple. They're also really well understood. Like they're old. Uh, blockchain, you have transparency if you want, immutability, um, and it's cryptographically secure. Uh, as so far, we haven't seen it broken yet. There's hybrid models appearing. So benefits of a database with the benefits of a blockchain. Uh, I direct you to Quarter, which is directly on a database. Um, it gives all those smart contract um, paradigms that we like to program with. Uh, similarly, Amazon's about to release one to ledger database. I haven't looked at it much. Uh, but again, it's a service in the cloud where you get all those guarantees of blockchain. Uh, 